our assassin waits invisibly in the corner of the room as their target unlocks the wall safe and all the secrets contained therein. With the safe opened, our assassin unleashes a bolt and a series of flames out of their finger, burning a hole in their target's heart. They uh, approach the safe, take the papers therein, open the door, and become uh, invisible and sneak back out of the mansion. Welcome to D&D build number 21, a build I'm entitling The Assassin Wizard. My name is Nathan, and I typically upload these videos about D&D uh, once a week on Saturdays or Sundays, depending on my schedule. And right now we are in the middle of the summer. I am still fairly busy, but I've managed to ha uh, have some time to be able to make the build for all of you. And so this build is one I'm pretty excited to share. This is a combination of a rogue and a wizard um, that's going to be primarily built around Scorching Ray using one of uh, my favorite very powerful races, the Bugbear. So let's uh, get started. Here is our agenda for this video. I'm going to kind of introduce and talk about the build concept. I'll talk about level one, levels two through six, level seven through nine, and levels 10 through 13, and 14 through 17 before summarizing. And at each of those key breakpoints, so level six, level nine, level 13, and level 17, I'm going to give a damage report and kind of talk about the tactics of this character and the kind of damage that they can output. Now, throughout the video, I may reference other builds of mine and talk about how this build compares. And if you want to see any of those, there, there will be a link in the description of this video to a spreadsheet that has all of my builds, all the numbers, and all of the links therein. Um, this particular one, you will look for Nova builds in the filter category. All right. So build concept. What does this build feature? So we are going to be a hybrid of a burst and control damage build, uh, emphasizing control of action economy when we can't do burst damage. Now, the importance of um, this character doing burst damage is going to be to eliminate a key target or two as quickly as possible and thus give your squad an advantage in action economy. Now, and interestingly, uh, this is going to be a burst build that I'm designing without action surge, which is a first for me, all my other Nova builds on the channel have used at least two levels of fighter to get action surge, and this one is not going to use it. Uh, this character is also going to be an excellent infiltrator with good skills as, as well as potentially spells to do it. Um, and this is going to be, you know, even though they're a, a little bit of a rogue, you're mostly going to be doing your roguish things with spells and some skills. Uh, this character is also going to be slippery and difficult to target in combat. We're going to have disengages, we're going to be invisible quite frequently and a lot of um, enemy abilities require you to, you to be able to see your target and this character is going to be invisible quite a bit. Uh, also I think this character offers pretty compelling opportunity uh, for art for role playing and can create a very interesting story. Now the books that, that you will need uh, for the core build you, you need the player's handbook, Xanthar's Guide to Everything, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and the uh, for the race I'm going to be using you need the Monsters of the Multiverse book. Uh, importantly, if you want to use a different race, you can, but it'll have this build's damage output, so you don't really want to do that. I'm also going to be using a spell or two out of Fizzvan's Treasury of Dragons, um, but you can always take different spells uh, if, if you want to. All right, uh, so at level one, we are going to be starting in Wizard as our first class. Now, alternatively, you could start Rogue. Um, the, the reason I like uh, the wizard class is we have better long-term saving throw proficiencies, in my opinion. If you do start rogue, you get an extra net skill, so you get to start with four proficiencies. Um, whereas if you start with wizard and then multi-class into rogue, you'll start with two and then gain one for a total of three. Um, you also get more hit points uh, if you start uh, first level in rogue, you get two extra, and then you also get a few more different weapon pro proficiencies. Now, this character is not going to be using weapons outside of maybe the first four or five levels. Um, so you're probably, honestly, I like having the better saves. And so that's the one that I'm going to go with. So as a, a wizard at first level, we, we don't get proficiency with any armor. And we get proficiency with daggers, uh, darts, slings, staffs, and light crossbows. And we get our wizard spell casting and the arcane recovery feature. What this does is once... Um, I think it's uh, once per long rest, during a short rest, we can recover a number of spent spell slots whose total level is equal to or less than half of our wizard level rounded up, and we can't recover any spell slots higher than level 5. We also get proficiency in intelligence and wisdom saving throws. So if we were a rogue, we would get dexterity and, in and intelligence. 
I personally, you know, dexterity saving throws are nice, um, but mainly they reduce damage. And at high levels, you really want wisdom saves. I would, and between the two, I would rather have wisdom. So I'm going to be starting with wizard to get that. Again, if your story works differently on your character, feel free to start rogue. All right, now for our race, we are going to be using the bugbear out of Monsters of the Multiverse. And there's one very specific reason I'm picking this, but let's kind of go through their features. So uh, the bugbear is a, a medium humanoid with a speed of 30 feet. They have dark vision out to a range of 60, which is pretty standard for most races. They have a fate ancestry feature, which gives them advantage on saving throws to resist the charmed uh, condition. They are long limbed. So on your turn, your melee reach is extended by five feet. They have a powerful build, which means they ca their carrying capacity is determined as if they were large. Um, they are sneaky, so they get proficiency in stealth, and they can move through spaces and squeeze as if they were a small creature. So interestingly enough, this character is medium-large race. It's medium-large and small at the same time. And most importantly, they get the surprise attack feature, and this is the main reason why we are picking this race and kind of one of the key things to build around. So what this feature does is if we hit an enemy... Uh, with an, an attack roll, and they haven't acted yet in combat, that uh, that hit does an extra 2d6 damage. Now, importantly, this is not limited to just um, weapon attacks. It also works on spells. So if we have a spell like Scorching Ray, and we can hit a target uh, multiple times, uh, we're going to get that surprise attack 2d6 bonus on each hit that we get against a creature that hasn't acted yet. Uh, so that's going to be uh, a big factor in determining our damage output, and it's something that kind of brings this build together and actually makes it possible. All right, as for our ability scores, we're using the point by method as always. I'm going to take 15s in dexterity, constitution, and intelligence, and put our racial plus one in dex, and our racial plus two in intelligence. This gives us a starting hit points of eight, so six from being a wizard, plus two from our constitution modifier. All right, we also get uh, spells here. Um, so we uh, get three cantrips. I would take Minor Illusion, Told the Dead, and Ray of Frost. These are just kind of fit thematically with what this character does. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. We get six spells in our spell book, and we can prepare four at this point. So I would be sure to take Absorb Elements, Disguise Self, Find Familiar, Mage Armor, and maybe Tasha's Hideous Laughter. Um, also, uh, if you're... DM allows the Silvery Barb spell out of the Strixhaven book. I would absolutely take that, probably instead of Tasha's Hideous Laughter or maybe Absorb Elements at this level. And Magic Missile and Sleep are some potential good options here as well. All right, so for our starting equipment, we should have 100 gold base from being a wizard. I'm going to use gold buy here, um, and then an additional 10 from our background. So I would take a spell book, uh, a wand to be our casting implement a light crossbow, maybe a couple daggers. This leaves us with enough money to buy yourself a set of cut of leather. So if you wanted to use that and not mage armor, it would drop your AC by a point, but would save you a spell slot. Um, and, and long term, we probably want to be using light armor on this character, uh, so long as it's better than mage armor. Um, although importantly, we can't wear that um, set of leather armor just yet. Now, from, for our skills, I want to talk about this a little bit because this is a character where these skills are somewhat important to the RP of the character. So from our class and our race, I want to take Arcana and Investigation as well as Stealth, which we get from being a bugbear because we're sneaky. Uh, then uh, our, for our background, I want to take the Sage, um, and this will give us proficiency in History and Arcana, but since we already have proficiency in Arcana, we can make it Acrobatics. And importantly, you don't want to take Thieves Tools proficiency from your background because we'll get it from multiclassing in Rogue. Now, for the kind of RP of this story, I imagine that we're an initiate in some kind of um, something like what, what I'm going to call the Order of the Hidden Flame, which I'm going to say is a group of cunning magic wielders and spellcasters who specialize in infiltration, spying, um, and even assassination or stirring up riots and that kind of thing. And I imagine our character is kind of an apprentice in that group. So they have some skills in magic, some skills in investigating, um, and they might be sneaking in to steal something, whether it's information or a physical object, or even sneaking in to kill someone. All right. Now, at level two, we are going to take our rogue dip, and we're going to kind of continue this for a little bit. So as a first level rogue, we get proficiency in light armor and a skill off the rogue list. I'm going to take percep uh, perception. Also get proficiency in thieves tools, so now we have that immediately. 
and we get expertise in two skills of our choice and we can pick our thieves tools here i'm going to take stealth and perception one of the important things is that this character needs to be sneaky and this is going to be very important we also get sneak attack at this point this is a 1d6 and we can apply our sneak attack once per turn we make an attack with a ranged weapon or a finesse weapon and either have advantage on the roll or an ally within five feet of the target and we can't have disadvantage so at these early levels i i uh the plan is generally speaking we're going to use our light crossbow to make attacks and basically kind of act like a rogue maybe use our magic to defend ourselves with shield and that kind of thing we do have a familiar so they can use the help action to give us advantage which means we should be able to sneak attack pretty reliably here at these early levels Level three, we are a rogue two, and we get cunning action. So now we can use our bonus action to take the uh, dash, disengage, or hide action. And this is just another way that we can be slippery, and uh, this will apply even once we get into casting spells. Now, at level three, level four, we are a rogue three, and, and this means our sneak attack bumps up to 2d6. We get the steady aim feature, so as a bonus action, we can... If we haven't moved, we can sacrifice all of our movement to give adva ourselves advantage on our next attack. Maybe we'll use this, maybe we won't, but it's not that big of a deal. But the main thing that we get here is our roguish archetype, and I'm going to go with the assassin on this build. This gives us some bonus proficiencies in the disguise kit and the poisoner's kit, but also gives us this feature called assassinate. And what this does is we have advantage on attack rolls against any creature that hasn't acted in combat yet. Great. And then if a creature is surprised, uh, any hit against them is an automatic crit. Now, the important thing here is, um, you know, how often do you get surprised? And I'll talk about that going forward. But one of the interesting things about Assassinate is at least on the 2014 version of the Rogue, um, this auto crit on hits is not limited to weapon attacks, which means it can also work on spells like the aforementioned Scorching Ray that's going to get boosted by our Rachel Surprise Attack feature. All right, at level five, we are going back to Wizard. Now, uh, for our subclass, which we get here immediately, uh, we want to be an Evocation Wizard. This means that we get Evocation Savant, so it's less expensive and takes less time for us to, to copy Evocation spells into our spellbook. We also get the Sculpt Spells feature. This is a pretty interesting one. We're not going to be using it a huge amount here, um, but, but what this does is we can exclude um, al allies from the area of effect or area of effect spells, and they automatically, they still count as targets, but they you can have them automatically succeed on their saves and take no damage, and you can do this with yourself as well. So uh, if, we, if we say had a fireball, even though we don't have that spell yet, and we were in a tight room, we could fireball all the enemies, but exclude ourselves and all our allies, for example. Also here at level 5, the power of our cantrips goes up, so they'll do a little more damage. That said, at this point, a sneak attack with our light crossbow is still going to be doing more damage than the cantrips, so you'll probably still be making crossbow attacks. We also get an additional first level spell slot here, and we get a couple more spells in our book. I would probably take magic missile, and then you can pick whatever you want. Um, again, silvery barbs if it's allowed. Sleep is pretty good at this point, although it's kind of falling off in value at level 5. Silent Image could be really good for your infiltration, detect magic, or identify, or any kind of other ritual spell might also be quite useful. Now, at level 6, we our, our arcane recovery bumps up to two levels of slots. Great. We get cantrip formulas, so we can switch out uh, our one of our wizard cantrips per short per long rest for any other wizard cantrip. Great. This is Atasha's feature, so you can customize your list a little bit. We are now a third level caster, which means we have four first level spell slots and two second level spell slots, and we get two additional spells in our spell book. And the ones that I want are invisibility and scorching ray. Now, Scorching Ray is going to be our main damage tool on this build, and Invisibility is actually a great spell to potentially set up a surprise round. So ideally, what this character would do is you would cast Invisibility on yourself, um, you would sneak in, maybe you're communicating with the rest of your party, say maybe you pick up the message cantrip or something like that, um, and so maybe they're following you at a distance, and then you initiate combat out of Invisibility with Scorching Ray. Uh, you will also have expertise in stealth to, to help with this, and ideally your target shouldn't know you're there, so you should get surprised fairly often if you're able to employ these tactics. Now, at level 6, it is time for our first damage report, so let's kind of talk about our tactics. I'll talk about the assumptions I'm going to make when calculating damage on this build, and we'll see what the numbers are like. So, our general tactics, we're going to come out of stealth from our invisibility spell and attack a target with Scorching Ray at level 2, applying our surprise attack on each hit. 
or we potentially uh, go first and go for a control spell. Now, the only one I have at this point is Tasha's Hideous Laughter, um, but uh, that that isn't a great option for us going forward. Again, our goal is to go first, hopefully with surprise, and eliminate a key target. Now, uh, for the sake of my math and my assumptions, I'm uh, for the sake uh, of our damage numbers and that kind of thing, I'm always going to be assuming we're attacking a target that hasn't acted yet. And I'm going to assume that we get surprise in 25% of the encounters that we're in. Uh, this number, uh, I'll talk about wow, its effect on um, our overall score at the end of the build. But I feel like this is reasonable if you're playing to your tactics and your party is going with you that you might be able to get surprise in one in four encounters. Uh, if you have seen uh, differently, um, please... Let me know. I, I I know that assassin is a very conditional thing and can be very hit or miss depending on the campaign. Um, but these are, are the things I'm going to use for my numbers. So uh, at this point, we have three scorching rays that we're going to fire off. These all have a plus six to hit with advantage, and each of them will do four d6 fire. Now that's two d6 base plus two d6 from the surprise attack. And if our target is surprised, these will all be critical hits. So, against an enemy with an armor class of 10 and no bonus to their saves, we would do an average of 54.5 damage. And against an enemy with an armor class of 15 and plus 5 to their saves, it would be 47.1 damage. Now, the numbers in parentheses that you can see there, the first number is if we don't have surprise, and the second number is if we do have surprise. So, uh, against that low armor class, we would potentially do up to 82 damage on average if the target was surprised and those were all crits. And against the AC of 15, it would be 70.5 if they were surprised and those were all crits. Now, compared to my other builds at this point, oh, so the way I got those numbers, it's basically our chance to, to not have surprise, uh, which is 75% times the low number plus 25% times the high number. So I'm taking a, a weighted average that way. So compared to my other burst builds at this level, uh, we are pr pretty much, generally speaking, bottom of the pack. That said, we're pretty close to my Ranger of the Depths build. That is a Warlock range burst build. We're actually ahead of my, the last Nova build I did, the Grave Digger, which is a Path to the Grave cleric that smites people. Um, we're also ahead of my Stormborn kind of Lightning Caster build at this point. So we're not the worst, but we're also not the best. Um, but that said, you know, if you don't get surprised, maybe you go for a control option instead. But if you do, you try to kill somebody with Scorching. All right, so let's see where we go from here. So at level seven, we are going to be a fourth level wizard. And uh, we get our first ability score increase or feat here. And I want to take the Fey Touched feat. Uh, this is a half feat, so we get to boost a, 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 a mental stat of our choice. I'm going to pick Intelligence. And we get two spells. One of them is going to be Misty Step, and the other one has to be an enchantment or uh, an enchantment or divination spell. Um, and we can cast each of the spells that we get in this way once per long rest without spending a spell slot. And the spell I want to take, if allowed, is Gift of Alacrity. Um, what this does, this is a spell out of, I believe it's, um, oh, it's, it, it's one, it's, it's like the official critical role source book that has like the echo knight and that kind of thing i think it's explorer's guide to wild mount um this feat is normally limited to i believe chronergy wizards um but it is uh, an enchantment spell so it's therefore eligible for fey touched so if your dm will allow you to use content out of this book you can take this spell what it does is it lasts for eight hours and it allows you to add a you or the creature you you enchant with it no concentration required eight hour duration and you get to add a d8 to your initiative rolls so importantly on this character, uh, we need to make sure that we're going before any creature that we want to kill, whether we're surprising them or not, because um, even if we surprise them and we go after them, once their turn is done, they're no longer surprised, so we can't nuke them. So this will boost our initiative. Um, now, if your DM doesn't allow this spell, I would take command. It's a great non-concentration control spell that upcasts very well. They also get a fourth cantrip here. I would prepare Mind Sliver, but again, we can switch these out on a long rest. So take the ones that you need because we have cantrip formulas. We also get two more spells in our book and an additional uh, second level spell slot. Um, the ones I would probably take here are Enhance Ability and Web. Enhance Ability can help our stealth or one of our allies' stealth, and Web is a good control option that we really need if we're not going for kills with Scorching Ray. Uh, a spell like Knock would also be very useful here to unlock doors, and also potentially Tasha's Mind Whip to do that kind of control um, and damage at the same time without some duration. 
At level eight, we are a wizard five, so arcane recovery is now three levels of spell slots, and we get our first third level spell slot and two more spells. The spells I would take here are slow, which in my opinion is, I like this spell better than its top competitor, hypnotic pattern, mainly because you can still kill the creatures that are affected by it, doesn't have an area and that kind of thing. And then I take Fireball. Uh, this spell is great for evocation wizards because again, we can exclude our allies as potential targets and being able to do that blast damage is just great. Level nine, we're going to be a wizard six, and this means we get potent cantrip. So what this does is that uh, if an enemy um, passes a saving throw against one of our cantrips, they still take half damage. This can be great with Toll the Dead or Mind Sliver um, just to boost the damage of those when you're going to be using them. We get another third level slot, and we get another couple spells in our in our spell book. I would for sure probably take Major Image to help with our infiltration and manipulation, that kind of thing. And it wouldn't be a wizard if we didn't have counter spells, so I'll go ahead and take this. It might be great to take Fly here as well. And on this character, we should be, you know, hopefully looking for more spells we can scribe into our book. That's one of the great things about wizard is you can get more spells than just the ones that are given to you every level up. Now, at level nine, it is time for our next damage report. So what has changed since last time? Well, we've gained Gift of Alacrity to boost our initiative. We boost our intelligence to 18, which will help uh, our attack rolls. We've gained third level spell slots, as well as some additional control and utility options. And we have Potent Cantrip for our sustained damage when we need it. So, uh, our tactics haven't really changed other than our control spells. We have some better ones available. And we can now cast Scorching Ray at level 3. So, our damage at this point, we have a plus uh, 8 to hit with advantage because we're going for our target. Uh, doing that 4d6 fire, 2d6 base, plus 2d6 per ray from Bugbear. We have 4 because we're upcasting the spell. And again, we're assuming 25% of our encounters are potentially uh, begun with a surprise round. So at this point, against an armor class of 10 and no bonus to their saves, we would do 73.8 damage on average at that 25% surprise ratio. Again, the, and the numbers in the parentheses are uh, not surprised and then surprised. And against an armor class of 16, it would be 65.7 damage. Uh, now, since last time, uh, you know, where are we tracking at this point? Well, it's... Uh, we are, we've pretty much fallen back to the back of the pack. We are uh, slightly ahead of pretty much nobody at this point, and all of the dedicated burst builds I've made at this point are better than this character. But again, we're even if we can't, you know, potentially surprise a target, if we do get surprised, the damage is good. We're actually you know, starting to keep up with a lot of people at that point. Um, but if we don't get surprised, you might be better off just casting a control spell. All right, uh, so... Um, and since last time, this is an increase of about 18 to 19 points, or 35 to 40%. And most of this is because of the accuracy increase, as well as um, we got another Scorching Ray. All right, so at uh, level 10, we are going to be a Wizard 7. And I, I should mention, we are going, uh, we're going to keep going with Wizard the rest of our career on this character. So, four levels of spell slots with Arcane Recovery, um, our third, third level spell slot, first, fourth level spell slot, Two more spells in our book. Now, the ones I want here, you really want greater invisibility on this character um, because unlike the normal invisibility spell, this one doesn't wear off when you cast a spell or make an attack or do anything, although it only lasts a minute instead of an hour. But that said, this is going to be our go-to option now because we should be able to be invisible throughout the duration of combat. I also want Ralithim Psychic Lance. This is that one spell out of Fizzbands. This spell is a great um, single target damage and control option it applies a pretty debilitating debuff um, if the enemy fails their save against it targets intelligence saves which are usually pretty low on most monsters at level 11 we are going to be a wizard level 8 which means another ability score increase or feat and let's go ahead and cap our intelligence at 20 uh, we, the power of our cantrips also goes up here so that's going to be three damage dice on pretty much all of them we get another fourth level spell slot uh, two more spells i'd probably take dimension door for mobility potentially we can use this to bring an ally into the stronghold that we're infiltrating and that kind of thing and then if you didn't already have tasha's mind whip i would totally grab it here for again uh that control and debuff that is non-concentration because we'll probably want to be concentrating on greater invisibility or a control spell at level 12 we are wizard nine five levels of spell slots for arcane recovery and our first fifth level spell slot now, there are a lot of good 5th level spells. The two I would get guaranteed here are Animate Objects for damage per round and Wall of Force for control. Level 13, we are a Wizard 10, and we get Empowered Evocation. 
This is a really cool feature. What this does is once per turn, when we make a damage roll for an evocation spell, we can add our intelligence modifier to that damage roll. Now, unfortunately, with Scorching Ray, this means we can only apply this once. But interestingly, this, the Magic Missile spell, which we do have, only does one damage roll, which then works for all the missiles. So if you um, fire off a Magic Missile, each Magic Missile at this point would do 1d4 plus 6 force damage. And you could potentially do some pretty good guaranteed damage with that. And that is a cool thing that Evocation Wizards have access to. We also get a couple more fifth level spells here potentially i would take polymorph even though it's a fourth level spell just for that utility and the ability to save an ally and then synaptic static is basically a psychic fireball that targets intelligence saves which i love targeting and then also applies a debilitating control type effect so at level 13 it is time for our next damage report and what has changed since last time well, we've capped our intelligence at 20. We have greater invisibility for being invisible potentially the entire combat. We've got empowered evocation to add that plus five to our damage with our evocation spells once per turn. We have some our fifth level spell slots and we've gotten some additional control and utility options. So our tactics now, we're gonna pl be planning on coming out of stealth with, with greater invisibility to get surprise and then attacking our target with Scorching Ray now upcast to level five and applying our surprise attack on each hit. Alternatively, we go first and uh, apply a control spell like Wall of Force, Slow, or Web. And remember, if allowed, we should have the Gift of Alacrity to boost our initiative, and hopefully we can go in the top of the, the turn order most of the time. Again, I'm still assuming a surprise ratio of 25%. So, we now have six Scorching Rays uh, with a plus 10 to hit, with advantage, each doing 46 fire, and we have plus 5 damage on the first uh, Scorching Ray that hits from a powered evocation. So at this point, against an enemy with an armor class of 10, we would do 115.7 damage on average. Against an enemy with an armor class of 17, it would be 106.7. And uh, again, the numbers in the parentheses, the number on the left is our damage against a creature that's not surprised, and the number on the right is our damage against a creature that is. Now, for our kind of amortized numbers at the surprise ratio of 25%, we are still the worst um, dedicated burst build I've ever made at this point. We're only ahead of my support slash burst warlord build. That said, if we do have surprise, these numbers are much more competitive and we are much more middle of the road. So if you don't get surprise, again, you might just want to consider going for a control option. But if you do, consider killing your target with your auto crit scorching. All right. At, uh, oh, and since last time, this is a bump of about 41 to 42 points or an increase of 57 to 60%. And again, this is just because we've increased our number of Scorching Rays by 50% from 4 to 6 and also gained that flat damage bonus. At level 14, we're going to be a Wizard 11. We now have six levels of Arcane Recovery that we can get back. Importantly, we can't uh, recover spell slots higher than 5th, so this could potentially be 2 thirds, a 5th and a 1st, etc. We also get our first 6th level spell slot and our first 6th level spells. I would take Chain Lightning, Wonderful Blasting spell, and then Mass uh, Suggestion is an amazing control spell that can potentially end encounters on its own, and it doesn't take concentration. At level 15, we are going to be a Wizard 12, and all we get at this level uh, is an Ability Score Increase or Feat and two more spells in our book. Now, for the spells I would pick, I would honestly pick your favorite uh, which is spell that you've been lacking here. Something like Contingency might be fun on this character for invisibility or a warp out with Dimension Door. And as for our feat, I would take either Resilient Con or the Alert feat. Alert would just boost our initiative and help us go first more. But that said, I really like having Resilient Con on this character to fortify our concentration saves. Because um, namely, uh, we've been relying on being slippery and not getting hit to maintain our control spells or our greater invisibility. And this will give us a bunch more hit points, um, as well as making us, uh, you know, giving us proficiency in that save. So I'm going to go with Resilient Con on my build here. Um, that said, if your DM does allow you to get a free feat at character creation, and especially if it's limited, I would totally go with Alert. It would work very well on this character. Level 16, we are Wizard 13. That means seven levels of spells with Arcane Recovery, and we now have our first seventh level spell slot. We get two spells here of 7th level or less, and I want to take Force Cage for the amazing concentration-free control, as well as the potentially problematic Simulacrum. This is a very powerful spell. It lets you create a copy of yourself. It takes a while to cast. Um, assuming that your DM allows this, I'm going to say that we have a single copy of ourselves going forward here. That said, when I present numbers, 
Um, I'm going to, I will also give the numbers if we don't have a simulacra. And finally, at level 17, we are a wizard 14, and this means that we get over channel, which is an evocation feature. This is a really cool feature and one that I really love. What this does is one, uh, when we cast a spell of fifth level or lower, and importantly, this is the level we cast the spell at, we can deal maximum damage on all of the damage dice. It also has to be an evocation spell. Um, and then if we do it again before we finish a long rest, we take, I think it's like uh, 2d12 necrotic damage for each level of the spell that we cast. Um, so I'm probably not using this more than once per long rest, but we're going to use this to do some pretty silly burst damage, especially if we can get the auto crits um, for surprise. So uh, let's see what our damage numbers uh, are like now in our final damage report. So what has changed since last time? Well, we've gained 7th level spells and slots, including Simulacrum. Uh, I'm going to assume we have one. So there's a copy of our Bugbear Wizard Assassin. We also have Over Channel, which means that we can maximize our damage dice. So this, what this means is that those 46 uh, will always be 24 damage, and on a crit, it'll always be 48 damage. Um, in terms of non-damage things, we are now proficient in Constitution saves and got some more health and some additional control and utility options. So... Our tactics now, they haven't really changed, uh, except we're going to over-channel that 5th level Scorching Ray. Uh, if we were to upcast it to level 6, we would get one more beam, but it wouldn't be maximized damage, so we want to make sure we over-channel it instead. Um, or we go first and cast a control spell. But whatever we're going to do, our Simulacrum is also going to do the same thing, which means we can potentially double our damage. And I, you know, we still have that same surprise ratio of 25%. So... Um, we have six Scorching Rays here, each with a plus 11 to hit with advantage, and they will do 24 fire damage because of the over channel. We have plus five to hit for from our first uh, hit from Empowered Evocation. Importantly, um, you know, a crit from an over channeled Scorching Ray at this point will do 48 fire damage, which is the same as a max damage from a third level fireball. Um, and then we have auto crits if our target is surprised. And again, we have a total of 12 Scorching Rays actually because we have one Simulacrum. So, what do, our, uh, what do our damage numbers look like now? Well, against an enemy with an armor class of 10 and no bonus to their saves at that assumed surprise ratio of 25%, we would do 390.4 damage, and against an enemy with an armor class of 18, it would be 358. Now, if we don't have surprise, that's 325 and 300, and if we do have surprise, that is 584.8 and 534.4. Uh, without the simulacrum at this point, we'd be up to 195.2 and 179.5 at our assumed surprise ratio. Now, interestingly enough, at this point in our career, um, if we uh, have the one simulacrum at this surprise ratio, we are actually the best burst damage build I've ever made. Uh, if we don't have the simulacrum at the surprise uh, ratio, we are more middle of the pack. We're, we're pretty close to 200, but we're not quite over it. Um, and this is more toward the bottom half. Although that said, with Surprise, this character is very good and probably in the top third. Uh, with Surprise, with Simulacrum, again, we are unparalleled. Without Surprise, with the Simulacrum, we are very, very good, um, but, not, but not quite the best. So, uh, since last time, this is an increase of 250 to 275 points, assuming we have the Simulacrum, for about a 236% increase. Um, now, if we don't have the simulacrum, it's a, bo a boost of 73 to 80 points, uh, 68, 69% increase. All right. Um, so let's uh, go into our summary and kind of talk about this character as a whole. So the, to get the, for the, what is the overall score of this character? Now, to get this, I take our damage numbers at all of our damage reports and average them into one number. And for this character, uh, at our assumed surprise ratio with our simulacrum at level 17, this is of 151.6. Now, uh, it is 104.8 if we don't have the simulacrum, and uh, if we, um, uh, depending on our surprise ratio, assuming we have the simulacrum, our overall score varies from a 126.6 to a 226.5, um, depending on our, on our surprise ratio, and without the simulacrum, de again, depending on the surprise ratio, that is an 87.5 to 156.5. Now, assuming that's a lot of numbers, assuming that we had the simulacrum and we always got crits, uh, then this is the best burst damage build I've ever made. But that said, I feel like the 25% with a simulacrum is more reasonable, which puts this kind of more middle of the road, just below my Fiend Knight build overall.
Now, uh, if I was going to take this, this version of the build level 20, it would be 100% be Wizard 17 for ninth level spells, including Wish. Uh, I think uh, the power of these spells to warp the world is amazing and something I would not want to leave on the table. Um, now, other things you could potentially do with this character if you wanted to get a little more, bit more out of it, depending on what the level range of your campaign is, um, taking a dip in Fighter for Action Surge could mean another set of Scorching Rays. Taking a dip in single level dicks in Hexblade would give you the Hexblade's Cursed feature, which again applies to each hit, so that could be another flat damage bonus. Um, there's some interesting things you can do there with Magic Missile and Hexblade and Fighter and that kind of thing. Um, you could also do a similar kind of package to this character, the, the taking the whole Assassinate Scorching Ray thing with uh, a Sorcerer or a Sorcerer Warlock. You could potentially look in some Scorching Rays and do some Eldritch Blast with an Assassin Sorlock. Um, but generally speaking, all of these kind of dilute your stats a bit more than this build. Um, they dilute your casting pool. Uh, you lose access to over channel, which is actually a big deal on this character. That's like about a 70% damage bump. And you also lose access to ninth level spells and a lot of the control that this version of the character uh, has. Um, now again, about that magic missile option, um, that's just a great thing to have again, because empowered evocation applies to all of the magic missiles because there's only a single damage roll. So if you upcast your magic missile, you could basically, you know, multiply your damage by your intelligence modifier and the number of missiles you had. One of the cool things I like about this build is that even though we've basically and essentially wasted three levels on Assassin, uh, we're still a wizard with high level wizard casting. We are, of course, behind a full wizard, but we've got some additional out of combat skills that may not require us to use our spell slots. Um, now, uh, the bugbear race doubles the best case damage output of this build, um, even, uh, and uh, it's pretty much the only one that works with this. Um, and so, yeah, this is pretty much the only choice. Uh, one more thing I wanted to say about this build, um, if you've been seeing some of the sneak peeks of the 2024 Player's Handbook content, um, this build will actually not work with the 2024 version of the Assassin. Um, because that uh, one requires you to proc sneak attack, and the current version only requires you to score um, a hit, which can be a, an attack roll with a spell. So this is a cool, interesting thing in this kind of whole realm of attack roll spellcasters, something that's only possible with the 2014 version of the rules. Um, that said, you know, the, the power of your uh, Scorching Ray assassinations, again, depends so much on that surprise ratio. Um, so... It depends on how your table and your party play. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, this was a really cool and fun build for me to make. Um, I personally think that this would be a fun build for a one shot um, or even um, you know, a ongoing campaign. You might not be the most powerful character, but this character is gonna be really fun. And the whole RP and story of this character, I think would just be a blast to bring to the table. Uh, once again, my name is Nathan. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.